Hello everybody and welcome to Lockdown Literature, courtesy of the Studio Online and the National Lottery Community Fund. You are about to listen to an audio story from a series of writing gathered during the COVID-19 lockdown from both the adults and children's write-on sessions. So relax, settle back and enjoy a selection of writing from some of the finest creative minds at the studio. Rubble in the Rubble by Richard Bradshaw Pride is such a silly thing. Examples everywhere. As long ago and as recently as the last century, for instance, some people used to fight each other just because they were wearing different coloured football shirts. Incredible. They weren't even footballers. Just people who used to watch it. Nobody plays it anymore. No wonder it died out. Mind you, they used to have wars too. Whole nations wiping each other out. Well, trying anyway. The last one was nearly 80 years ago, before I was born. It ended in the early 2020s. That was also around the time of that big virus thing they told us about at school. Some people say the two facts were connected, that somehow people finally came to their senses about each other, but I doubt it. I reckon it would take more than a lesson, however harsh, to teach the human race anything. It's November 2099 now. Soon we'll be in another century. Now there's a funny idea. They say that people sometimes die in the desert just because one leg is longer or stronger than the other. You see, without meaning to or realising it, they don't walk in a straight line, but in a curve. If you walk like that for long enough, you come back to where you were, a full circle. But people usually die before that happens. I remember years ago, our teacher at school told us, history is a hamster wheel. All we can do is try to stay on it and enjoy the ride. I didn't get it then. Maybe I do now, maybe not. History in the making. Pride is such a petty minded little thing. Everyone knows that, surely. At least they do until they find themselves something to be proud of. It can get pretty ugly then. Sometimes you get a really close look at it. Yeah, pretty ugly. Bilkston. That was the next town up from us along the river. You might remember it from when the ever popular Robofest was held there. Robofest 27, to be precise, as every Bilkstonian knew to the letter, about eight or nine years ago. You couldn't shut them up. They were so proud to have been awarded this singular honour, as they called it. As if it was some title they'd earned personally, just by being born there. It got right on my nerves, I can tell you. That and the smug little stance they struck up like they were posing for a statue or something. It made us Crabshavians feel quite superior. We, we all agreed, would conduct ourselves rather better than that if roles were reversed. They never shut up about it. Well, not until a few years later, when the news about the new Nightingale Observatory project broke. (laughs) For reasons we never really understood at the time, Crabshaw, that's our town, was the selected, or as we preferred, chosen spot. And in no time at all, here they built it, in our otherwise unremarkable little hamlet. 
That shut him up good and proper in Bilky, that did. Yeah, good and proper, that shut him up. The Ob, as it came to be known, outshone the shabby little one-time scrappy fester, which is what we call the singular honour. Outshone it by miles, and didn't we let them know it? I'm sorry to say I was as bad as any of my fellow crabbies. I mean, we'd had a belly full of all that bragging. So I joined in the bilk basin as much as the worst of us. I should have known better. Should have listened more carefully. Then I'd have heard the warnings. Heard the hamster wheels spinning. If I'd known more, I wouldn't have thought I knew quite so much. You know that old saying, you live and don't learn. I could tell you more about that time, but what's the point? At the end of a race, nobody asks where anyone was standing at the beginning, do they? It's how it finishes that people want to know. So I'll tell you about that. What we found out later was the orb wasn't just an observatory. <laughs> How glib does that sound now? It was also a training and research centre for we never knew quite what, and housed a laboratory about which we knew even less. It stood on the heights, a veritable beacon. We were curious, of course, but if you asked, you never got anything you could call an answer. And Besides... You get used to things, don't you? We all just paddled along together. We basked in its vicarious glory. We were, after all said and done, born here. I said I'd tell you about the end, but I suppose if some of us are still here, then it wasn't really the end as such, but it was the end of something. It was also the start of something else. I'll tell you a story, a true one at that. In the 1950s or so, some car firm in America developed a new car which all the right people agreed was the best one since, oh, the last one they'd all said the same thing about. They called it the Nova. It was tremendous. They all said so. Went down a storm. It sold well nationally, a marketing triumph and Amidst much fanfare and no doubt at great expense, they launched it across Europe and South America. In Europe, it was a sensation, uh, apart from in Spain. But hey, what can you do? Some people don't know a good thing when they see one. In South America, it was a total flop. Why? It was a magnificent car. Why then? They were mystified. Until, that is, some bright spark pointed out to them that in Spanish, no va, means it doesn't go. They recalled it at some astronomical cost and rebadged it as super duper or something. And it became a roaring success, a winner. A little bit of research can go a long way. Amen. I'm trying to walk a straight line here, but I might as well complete the circle now and tell you. It emerged that the reason our scruffy little town was the ideal location for the OB was that it was on the direct flight path to guarantee a grandstand view of, wait for it, a supernova. Hey, not just any old nova, a super one. One that was fast approaching the earth from some place or other. The town turned into a gold mine almost overnight. It was like a madhouse. Buy your tickets now. Don't miss this once in a lifetime, etc., etc. Of course, we lived here already. Our seats were guaranteed. We were so proud. Two hotels were built, quick as a flash. Three or four things called pubs opened up. Everybody loved this quaint name. Apparently, there used to be loads of them at one time. My granddad used to talk about them, but I never thought I'd see one for myself. Like visiting some living prehistoric site. 
I like them. There was an economic boom. Very proud indeed. In thought, word and deed, in fact. <laughs> we tried not to gloat, but we didn't try very hard. Why would we? Everything was so easy now and would be for a long, long time. So we thought. You probably know the story already about the supernova and what happened next. Or some version at least. You haven't heard ours though. How could you? All communication with the outside, as we've learnt to call it, was blocked from the start, by which I mean the end. Oh, some people slipped through the net, or so we reckon. There's been no official mention. But why else would the not very secret police be coming round asking after them? I told them I knew nout about out, and I'm sticking to that. Besides, it's the truth. Though I don't mind the locals having the sneaking suspicion that I know more than I'm saying. It makes me feel important. But I don't want any attention from you know very well who. We don't even get television in this area anymore. No radio. No more hologram nights for us, mate. Though in truth, I don't miss all that flapping pap. Still, it would be nice to have the option. Know what I mean? I haven't seen a newspaper in yonks. You get used to it. That's what I keep telling myself. It might even be true. I went for a walk round by the old fish market this morning. Just mooching, you know. I saw this young kid. Hair like an overgrown bird's nest, if you remember then. Face a mass of smudges that could have been soot, could have been shit. All you could say about the clothes was that they definitely once belonged to someone else. Boy, girl, in between, he couldn't tell. Doesn't matter. Looking for something to eat, no doubt. Same as me. We looked at each other. That's all there is to say about it. We looked at each other. Just the two of us in the whole wide world. I exaggerate. The place was teeming with other lost faces. But not one soul paid us the least scrap of attention at that precise moment. At that precise moment, something shifted out of the corner of my eye, darted and then came to a trembling dead stop under the broken remains of a mangled up bicycle right at the child's feet. The mucky-faced little sod swooped with a speed and dexterity which, quite frankly, astounded me. Picked whatever up and held it furtive as captured treasure in grimy, cupped hands. Filthy talons, more like. The waif pondered me now with a new demeanour. With a cinematic attempt at silent menace, I slowly moved towards the broken bicycle trying to stamp my laughable authority on the situation. I would stand no chance in a foot race with this feral creature, and this fact was well and truly known between us. I edged closer and picked up a buckled bike wheel. Tireless, inner tube, a long-distant memory, almost spokeless, and held it by the rusty rim between thumb and first finger. I raised my arm until the wheel was above my shoulder, behind my head, cocked and ready to be launched. We stared at each other, eyes gouging into each other like sworn enemies, itching. Mine never once left the clasping, grasping hands. I nodded towards them and grunted something unintelligible, even to me. The hands slowly separated and one, still carefully closed, was extended towards me in an obvious mix of resigned supplication and reluctant offering. If that kid had turned and bolted there and then, I would have floored it without a second's hesitation. But this kid was no fool. One, then another unwilling step was taken towards me. 
I must have relaxed, however slightly, but the little bastard sensed it and took off, not away where I might have had a shot, but towards and past me, faster than a cockroach across a kitchen floor. I tell you, this ragamuffin could run, arms and legs already pumping, sprinting, and all I had time to see was the protruding head of one very startled hamster, held in a protective fist. Then, just the disappearing back of one unidentifiable urchin, legging it down the road into the rubbish-strewn horizon. I hurled the wheel venomously after this retreating bag of rags, and with all the force I could muster. Funny thing, though. As I watched the wheel rolling, bouncing, careering down the road, hopelessly wide of the mark, a sense of empathy or something overcame me and I shouted with a tone of sincerity I hadn't heard from myself in a good old while. Hold tight and try to enjoy the ride! Then I turned away. Sod it. Nothing hurt but my pride. <laughs>